All right, let's bring in our next guest here on CHGO. Awesome to welcome Thomas Dimitrov, the former GM of the Atlanta Falcons, with us along with Eric Eager. You guys are partnering together here to do Sumer Sports. We are. We're, Sumer Sports is a is a uh, basically an analytic football analytic company that we're really excited about. It's backed by one of the world famous macro traders, Paul Tudor Jones, which is always great to have strong backing. He's he's an expert in in modern portfolio theory. We have we have such intelligence in this group, along with guys like Eric Eager, who's who's a you know PhD in, or a doctorate in, in mathematics, and he's also played football. That's a big thing, right? Get guys like that in there that understand football as we're building, along with probably 30 other data scientists and engineers in Sumer Sports, we think we can do some really special things with regard to roster optimization. So you, what you guys are doing, the aim is to still kind of help current NFL teams in the way they handle all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, back in the day, like at you know, Pro Football Focus, for example, where I was before, like we would build player evaluation tools. We'd help them project college to pro. We'd give them, you know, draft simulators and everything. But you still have to have kind of the algorithms to kind of put it all together, right? You got to be able, you know, you might be able to, you know, really pin down this wide receiver's a six out of nine or whatever, and, and this tight end's a four, but how do you how do you put it together and pay the six the right amount of money and the four the right amount of money and make sure that all those correlations are taken care of? Well, you both can answer this then, and the Bears hopefully have found their quarterback, but it's been a long search, and then you look around the league, and there's late round draft picks that are, I mean, look, Jalen Hurts is a late yeah. second. Brock Purdy was the story of the league, and yet people miss on them, and you guys are doing this evaluation. Why do you think the – and Thomas, you obviously could speak to this in depth. Why do you think that you guys have paid – This is you're the top of the profession, yet you miss on this position a lot, it seems. So let me start, and then I'll, we'll toss it over to Eric from, yeah. a, from a perspective. And that's what we, by the way, like with, with our relationship in doing our, our show. You're juxtaposing, you know, the two different uh, uh, data scientist uh, approach and a, and a GM, former GM approach. Look, I, 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 it's it's one of those positions that's not obviously the easiest to evaluate. But it's not just about, you know, the, the quarterback metric tree per how the guy throws, the strength of his arm. There's so much involved in that position. But there's also a leadership element that cannot be touched unless you really, really dig in. And we don't know that, right? We, we're talking about, you know, people over in, in uh, Green Bay and what's going to happen there if Aaron Rodgers leaves, does the quarterback in waiting there, ostensibly, does he have the same leadership ability that Aaron Rodgers has? Because to me, that is one of the most important things. You, you can have a quarterback back there that, that has a very good, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of vision, uh, anticipation, and a mind, but if he doesn't ha and, and also, you know, accuracy, but if he doesn't have the leadership ability to run it, Man, I think that's a that's a that's a doomsday event possibly. Yeah, this might seem silly to Bears fans, but like the hard part is actually not drafting the quarterback, right? The hard part is sort of like putting a team around him, making sure that when he's on rookie deal money, and the Bears did this with Mitch Trubisky, he's not a great quarterback, made the playoffs twice with him, or basically a 500 team in the years they didn't make the playoffs. The hard part is then saying, you know, projecting onto that, okay, how do you move on, right? And we see in the Super Bowl this week, you know, Jalen Hurts is the biggest surplus value in the NFL if you look at value produced on the field minus cost on, you know, in the salary cap. Like, they've been able to build A.J. Brown, the offensive line, the running backs, the defense to go along with it. And then you look at the other side, of course, Patrick Mahomes, you know, the one that got away. Like, he, you know, they've had to take away from him. And then the, the biggest question, in my opinion, in football analytics is determining if the guy is good with, you know, a rookie deal, you know, sort of the roster around him, can you start subtracting from him, pay him more money, pay him a market deal? Can he still be effective? And that's a really tough question to, you know, answer. If I could just add as well, like I think about when we go back to Matt Ryan in those early years, mm -hmm. right? Matt was an incremental leader and he was an inc incremental player in the league. And I believe that's important. He didn't just come out pounding his chest saying that he was going to take it over. We were very concerned about how what we were going to put around him. You guys remember, we brought in Michael Turner as a running back. You know, He did great things for us for four years and took a lot of pressure off of Matt Ryan. That is a big thing. The other thing I would say to you, which I've said a number of times today, that second year, there are so many intelligent D coordinators out there. You get a year under their belt looking at what this player can do. Brock, Brock Purdy comes back next year. There's a lot yeah. of people dialed into what his world is and the nuances of his ability. Shout out to the NIU Huskies, by the way. Michael Turner getting a mention, former PA, <laughs> PA in Northern Illinois. I just want to get that in there. Did you, I, I don't want to throw Ryan Pace under the bus here at all, but did you know at the time or did you think at the time that I don't know about this Trubisky pick with the two that were sitting there or 
No, I didn't. I think it was funny. You know, people often ask, of course we studied quarterbacks when you have a quarterback, but it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting deal, right? You really you don't go down as much into depth when right. you know you're riding you're the guy that you have. That sounds a little short-sighted, so I, I can't really comment on the ability of, of Mitch. I, that was fair. tough. we got to be yeah. fair, too, though. Like the, the Niners also traded that pick to, to the Bears and didn't take a quarterback when yep. their quarterback at the time was yep. Brian Hoyer. Like We all look back and say, of course, Mahomes, it was obvious, or Deshaun Watson, you know, was it was obvious, but it actually wasn't at the time. I right. mean, like the, 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 the draft market is fairly efficient. I think the Bears just got unlucky there, you know, and, and you know, it looks it looks easy in hindsight, but it really isn't in foresight. Well, and then Ryan ends up drafting Justin Fields, and of course doesn't get to see that out. But all right, you're you're the GM. You're Ryan Poles now. You have the number one pick. You have all the salary cap in the world this year. Number one space in the entire league. They strip the roster down. Um, give us the the, the perspective. Your perspective on a how great of a position is this to be in as a GM, but also how hard is it because you, you still got to get everything right once you, once you have all those assets. Well, you, you definitely do. And I know Eric has an opinion, and I, I, don't want, I won't take away your thunder on this because I know he has an opinion on what he would do. Look, I, I love being in that spot for them. I, you know, my history, I wasn't a trade-back guy really, right? And I, I took heat for that. I, only, I didn't because I really believed that our organization in Atlanta back in the days, you know, it, you know it, the reason that we weren't is because we always felt that we had a need to bolster, and I get moving back. I get the understanding, you know, that's what guys like Eric at PFF used to take shots at me. I joke around about it. We had a great relationship <laughs> when he was working there. I think it's really, really important. You know, look, I, I like, I'd love to see what, what is available there, but when you look at some of the D linemen, you guys need a D lineman, right? You need a rush guy, don't you? They, they, need, a whole, they need a whole D line. <laughs> okay. The whole I, team, really. I mean, other than the quarterback. <laughs> but but seriously, they need, they, need, they need two interior starters, yeah. they need two, two. ends. But, but isn't the, 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 the interesting part, though, and I think the Bears are in a really you know, unique team experience here where they, they actually don't have like that early second round pick they traded for a wide yeah. receiver in Claypool. And you also have a ton of cap space. And we know like, look what the, and the Jaguars were successful this year, but look what kind of caliber player you get in free agency. It's the Christian Kirks of the world where everybody else has to trade for Devonte Adams and Tyree Kill. The Bears are in an interesting spot where they have the first pick and they also have the cap space. Like you could trade yeah. that first pick to like Carolina and and for Brian Burns and pay Brian Burns because you act and you could get capital and you could also pay up and actually use the cap dollars on a guy who might be worth it. I think that's the really the catch twenty two when teams have a ton of cap space and they're not very good. They spend it all on like the free agents that aren't good enough to be retained right. by their own yeah. team. And that is a you know, that's a tricky thing and, and the only way that works and, and you know, I think ultimately for the Bears, it is good. It's just gonna come down to this much like it did with Jacksonville. If Fields is good, none of it's going to matter. And if Fields isn't good, none of it's going to matter. And so that, that, that's the tough part they're in. And if I may interject as well, you know, I hate to put a damper on you guys looking for a pass <laughs> rusher. You know, there are a lot of mistakes made in pass rushers. I mean, look, I, I was a part of them. I put my hand up. I mean, we, we, we bring, in, bring in Vic Beasley. He wins the sack title one year in 16, I believe it was. And then he plummets, right? This comes back to figuring out that personality side. It wasn't just a quarterback. I mean, he... I mean, I, I, he's a good person, but his passion for the game was waving and wavering, and we didn't figure that out. All I'm saying, you sit there, you can think about bringing in, um, you know, a, a rookie or, a, or a, a draftable pass rusher, versus bringing in someone like like Les did. I mean, Les needs a good friend of mine. F the picks and all his stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Les Les is, maintains to me, Thomas. The reason we were moving those picks is because we were going to bring bring people off. You know, from other rosters that we knew about, and there were no going to be no surprises. Even if that player came in and he slept in meetings, or he was a party guy, but he played on Sunday, we knew that we wouldn't fight it as long as everyone understood. We don't bring this guy and expect to change him. You bring in a guy like Burns, you Burns, you that you know what you're getting there. It's it's a really interesting concept versus bringing a young young guy in. Uh, how do you? Do the love of football quotient then? Because you got a guy sitting in front of you, right? Well, you better be eating this steak with the. I don't want it cooked. Just, just put that thing in your mouth. You okay? You love football versus some guys. They, you know, they get the money and they don't want to get killed every week. And they, their family's set up and and they they're just super talented and they worked hard enough, but they're not, you know, the all in guy. How would you try to figure that part of it? Well, out? look, I, I we've talked about this because I've. I could go around the league right now to 32 or 31 of my, my well, 32 of my contemporaries. I still call them my contemporaries. And, and they would all say, it's not about the player. We're not messing up on the player evaluation. It's not about the player. It's about the person. This is a really interesting concept that leads mm -hmm. into, I want to hear Eric's take on this. We are an analytics company trying to really hone in on the objective elements that we can take care of. Yeah. There are other elements out there that 
my point is all the GMs and all the presidents and head coach, they don't know. There's not an answer yet to figuring out the passion, you know, the desire, the, the, the love well, of the Well, that's what got me in trouble in the last hit where I got swore on air, so I'm not going to swear here. But, like, when <laughs> I was at swear. You when can I, swear. When I was at PFF, like, <laughs> I would always – I would go to my, my, my contemporaries in the league and I'd say, hey, my numbers really like this player. Why didn't he work out? And they said, Eric, he was an asshole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, and, like, yeah. And, and so – you know, obviously, you can't always account for that. And you don't, you know, there's, there's proprietary issues and stuff. But it does, like, when we think about what we're trying to do at Sumer, we're trying to incorporate all the data, not just having, like, the play by, you know, tracking data and all the great advancements we've all made. But we know there's, like, if you only have that, there's an irreducible aspect of being able to evaluate them. And to, you know, to your point, like it's, it's a huge part. I mean, we don't know what, when any of these, you know, the men, the, I mean, what was the, the guy you signed in, in Atlanta, Ray Edwards, right? Once yeah. he got his second contract with Atlanta, it was like, you know, that he worked and he had like multiple sack games and playoffs. Like he was a dog and then he gets to Atlanta. And it's just like a different yeah. guy. And, and like, you know, you, and it's hard to predict that. It's one of the most frustrating things as a team builder, a GM and a head coach, right? You sit there and you look your owner in the eye and you're like, no, man. <laughs> I remember swallowing deep so many times with Arthur saying, no, no, I, I, you can count on me, man. This is, this is the guy. This is what we're getting out of it. And it's tough. It is, it is, it's not an exact science back to what we're talking about. So if you're the Bears and you have a guy in Justin Fields who, by all accounts, from what we can tell covering him the last couple of years, background on Ohio State, checks those boxes from a personality standpoint, leadership standpoint. They seem to love him. I mean, there's some people that right now think the Bears should trade Fields, not the number one pick, and then draft Bryce Young or something. I'm, actually, you I'm actually one of those people. Okay. Like I, so my, my issue is... When you have all the resources the Bears have, like, and you look at Fields, and right now what Fields has proven is a bunch of good things. He, he, to me, like, you know, you're talking about 1,100 yard rusher at the quarterback position. There's only one guy in the history of the league that's done that. The issue is, is when, you know, the, when the Ravens bought into Lamar, they bought into the tight ends and the fullbacks and the defense to sort of like give them the best opportunity to win with that kind of quarterback. The problem is, is like that's not an efficient use of cap dollars when you have the clean slate that they have. The Ravens had a ready-made team that they kind of molded a little bit for Lamar. The the Bears have basically a clean slate, and so my thought process is: okay, if you think that Fields can be a drop-back passer that does not have to basically depend upon his legs to be good, then by you know, by all means, do everything around. Let get a left tackle, get a wide receiver, get a, uh, an edge player, get a corner, build the offense, build the team like you would. My issue is, is A, you're already two years into his rookie deal, and, you, and the information you have is sketchy at best that he can be that. And so do you reset the clock? And, and Fields is good enough where another team could give you a return. And, and so that, that, would be my, that would be my comeback to the idea that trading Fields is a ridiculous notion. Now, let me just add again, <laughs> this is going to be the counterpoint, the other element of it, right? The locker room element of it. The people believe in it. it's that right. what's But, but who's in the locker room for the Bears that's going to be there next year? Like I, <laughs> Well, no, I mean, look, I, I get your point. I, yeah. All I'm saying is we have to look at so many elements of, of that, right? That's a big thing. It's always yeah. been a big thing when you're, when you're our team building. Well, but the, the other thing I want to get in real quick is because I, and Mike, Mike Tannenbaum's one of these guys, too, that's a trade field, trade fields, and he's, and he's got some very valid points, and I like Mike, but I, I feel like the one thing that doesn't come up every time he does that argument, though, is you're also resetting the development clock. No and, question. And, and that, that's a huge part. Yes, it's great you get the rookie contract now for two, two yeah. more years, but all this two years that they put in the fields of development, is now that starts over with Bryce Young or whoever else you draft. I guess the question is, though, like you have the one, you have the naggy regime for one year of development, yeah. then you have this last year with Getze. Part of the reason they traded for Claypool was to get an eval on fields, but that kind of busted because he wasn't really there. Like the, I guess the question is, is, you know, if you take the ratio of the eval versus the time spent, what did you really get two years of eval on fields? I, that's really the question. Because to me, whether or not you trade fields is not, is of course very dependent upon your eval of him. Would you have asked me if you were my assistant GM, would you have asked me to trade Matt Ryan before it got expensive? Well, it's difficult. Uh, I'm just. I'm always interested. But, but, but Matt, I, I, I like your guys' show. Yeah, we yeah. have to check this out. Yeah. This is good it's, stuff. It's Super Sports Show with Eric Eager and Thomas Mitchell. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, on all platform pod, uh, podcast platforms. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> so so the CBA was a little bit different back then, right? Because you you paid Matt a lot when he was drafted, sure. so it's a little bit different. But no, I mean Matt Ryan, you know, as a passer, showed whatever he needed to show by the time he had his second contract. So I don't think like to me it's not to me Fields is like Fields. Get, 
took a sack on 15% of dropbacks last year. Like, that was 4% more than any quarterback in all of football. And we know the math says that it's partially offensive line and partially quarterback. And, you know, the question becomes is if he slows down a little bit or gets hurt, which he has been the last two years, does that get better or worse? Does he get more pocket awareness? And, yeah, I just think I, I think it's – the, the field's development has been weird in that, like, to survive the last two years, he had to run for 1,100 yards and didn't really get the reps in the pocket. So did you really get him, you know, like, I think year three is really going to be the first year you can evaluate him as a real NFL passer, which is the exact same thing you're going to have for Young uh, or, or Stroud, and you're three years in versus one year so, in. So, you know, Atlanta Falcons, as you know, passed up on fields, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they took Kyle Pitts, a great right. player. Yeah. Yeah. They, you got you know, obviously Kyle Pitts is Kyle Pitts, but they, they're in a spot now with their quarterback situation. It's always interesting to see when you look back, right, to see how things might have played out. Do you, there, do you still live in Atlanta? I do. Because yep. do, 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 he's a Georgia kid. He's in That's Atlanta. Exactly he, right. he, do, I mean, is there they, regret there, I no. mean, at least from the fan base? Do they do uh, they wish they had drafted Fields? You know, it's funny. I think they probably talk about it a yeah. lot. The other thing, again, we don't talk about this. When you have a guy who's right in your hood, right in your neighborhood, yeah. and he comes to your pro team, there's a whole other element that you're dealing with. You're dealing yeah. with a lot of people. You're dealing with a lot of hang on, hanger honors. You're dealing with tickets. You're t there's a lot. And this isn't just, you know, the average guard. This is your QB for hopefully Although years You would have been come, pretty yeah. good in that Arthur Smith off. Sure. I mean, if Mariota yeah. and, uh, and yeah. Ritter were doing okay in that run first scheme, I think he would have been great there. But yeah. You got to play on any late-round quarterbacks that you don't think will be taken in case the Bears want to have a little insurance here. I'm thinking about one guy in particular, but I won't say it. Maybe you'll say his name. Tanner McKee? No. Uh, he starts with an H, and then there's another H. Two colleges. Hendon Hooker? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, nice. yeah, I mean he's, got, he's, got the, he's got the athleticism. You have the injury coming off of, yep. so he would be a little bit of a development guy. But, I mean, it's hard not to watch – that Alabama game and think about, you know, when you're, you know, one of the things we do mathematically is we look, when we correct things, we say, okay, who did he play with and who did he play against, right? And, and in a Tennessee versus Alabama game, you're not playing with as good of players, but you're playing against the best. And when you perform that way, uh, that really does shoot their numbers up. So he was very impressive, um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, being able to run the hypo offense is, is, a, is a solid, you know, because there's a lot of pass volume, there's a lot of reads and that kind of thing. So, that might be a good one, especially you're getting a value because of the injury. Well, I, I love the idea now when you have these backup quarterbacks doing what they're doing. I, I mean, I'm sure owners don't. You're going to be paying more, that idea. I was listening to Michael Lombardi talk about it the other day. The idea of backup quarterbacks potentially garnering more money because you can see how important that is when your guy goes down. Matt Ryan, by the way, a little aside, one and a half games missed in 14 seasons with the Atlanta Falcons. That's pretty amazing. It doesn't happen these yeah, days, that right? Is that is pretty incredible. No I got one last thing for you because I'm always fascinated why GMs don't get more second cracks. It doesn't happen a ton. I would think that your name would be right there in the mix right now with anything that opens up. You have some ties to two former Bears GMs, too. I know you know Ryan Pace, and then you hired Phil Emery. Mm -hmm. uh, he was on your staff. It still is in Atlanta, right? He lives in Tampa now, but okay. he's still yeah, he's still in Atlanta, right, yeah, as, he, as a scout there. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. it just seems like these guys, I don't know what, it, coaches get recycled, but GMs don't. My, my, my take on that is coaches are very, you know, they're out front, as you know. GM's a little bit more now than 20 or 30 years ago. But coaches are out front, and they have a style attached to them. An owner can go back and say, okay, we just fired Dan Quinn. He was gregarious guy, blah, blah, blah. The next guy we, we have, we need a guy that's a little more quiet and cerebral. We can go out and look around the league. These guys are available. They're not going to do that with a GM, right? A GM doesn't have that sort of presence. So you can't fire Thomas Dimitrov and say, we're going to go out there and find someone that has a different personality who's a little less, you know, open-minded or whatever it may be. Well-dressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that, that, like I, that that's coat. why I think. I think, I think, I think there, there are so many really good former GMs out there. I do believe this. I'm not just talking about the ones that had two or three years. I'm talking about there are some good ones out there that don't get opportunities. It's, it's, to me, it's one of the only businesses out there that, that, is, that sort of subscribes to that. Are you kidding me? We are so much better... In, in year 13 right. from experience. Now, maybe things went awry, but I think you are versus you could get executive of the year awards in your first or second year. That's usually when they happen as a GM. 
and everyone's like, oh, this guy's so great, he knows everything about everything, but really you're that much better in those later years. Well, Why are you not marketable? And well, it I takes just, that much longer to really know whether or not your moves have worked too, right? Head sure. coaches, they can come in and like really change the culture and yeah. change the scheme, and they can make changes, and those are sort of sustainable. Yeah. Whereas for you, like when you draft a quarterback, and it takes a couple, or you draft like a whole team. You know, you, you don't always get what Brett Feach got this year, which is 10 draft picks. They're all playing. You're in the Super Bowl. Like, for the most part, it's going to be like a lag time of a few years. And what was the average GM? GM is 3.7 years or something like that. You're almost, yep. it's not even the length of one rookie contract. And by the way, I do, do believe that Brett Veach, he ha, he's a, who's a horse guy, right? He's got the trifecta. All of us desire this. He's got one of the very best owners. He's got one of the very best quarterbacks and one of yep. the very best head coaches. Yeah, yep. I mean, yep. uh, that's not taking you're away You're from giving him. them PTSD for the Mahomes thing, he's by great. the way, every, every time. It, don't worry, it, it happens like five it. times a day, every day. <laughs> I love um. it. I think Brett is really good, and he, and he by the way, we didn't, he just he, he settles so well with that head coach. Andy, he and Andy are yeah. so respectful of each other, even though there's a massive age difference. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what you covet in this league. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes Sr. went on the radio in Chicago last week and said that the Bears told his son that they were drafting him. So it set off a whole other firestorm. It's never going to go away. You didn't do stuff like that, did you? <laughs> no. Try, try to throw the scent off the dogs here a little bit. I'm going to tell this guy one thing. He's going to tell these people. Then all of a sudden you go the other way. I don't know. Maybe you do. I, I think we all do. So I hate to say that. Bit. It's normally not my, my way, but I think you kind of have to at times. I yeah, hate to it, say it. it, it yeah. It's interesting. There's plenty of paranoia in April, right? <laughs> there it is. Uh, God, this is awesome. Uh, so it's at Sumer Sports on Twitter. I could tell already the show has to be outstanding. Consumer Sports Show uh, with Eric Eager and Thomas Dimitrov, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. Perfect. Thanks, awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Right. And thanks for watching CHGO.